Hi, I'm Chad. Hi, I'm Matt. And we're trail guides with the Yukon Conservation Society here at Miles Canyon. The Yukon Conservation Society is a charitable nonprofit organization established in 1968 that works towards sustainable ecosystems and communities across the Yukon. YCS does this through research, advocacy, and education. We're going to bring you on a virtual tour of Canyon City and the Miles Canyon area. Now it's going to be a little abbreviated because we're used to having two hours, but uh, we'll try our best to give you a sense of our rich natural and cultural history of the area. We'd like to first acknowledge the area that we'll be walking through today on our virtual tour, the traditional territories of the Kwanlin Dun and Tonquachan First Nations. Conveniently, Kwanlin means river flowing through a narrow space, hence Miles Canyon. So 8.5 million years ago, a vent opened up in a mountain just south of here above our ski hill and poured a uh, hot molten rock into this valley and created uh, the canyon you see behind us. The canyon walls are a basaltic rock and they form pillars, five or six-sided pillars, that are actually quite fragile and disjointed, as you can see below us. Uh, shortly after the lava flow and about 10,000 years ago, a glacier became stagnant right here. Uh, and when it stopped moving, it created a giant glacial lake uh, called the Champagne Glacier Lake, uh, which filled this whole area um, believed to be as far as Haines Junction. This so was a really, really quite a large lake. And as it flowed, and I imagine it even had some sort of tide, it slowly cut through the rock. It slowly cut through this flow that was there and created over time what the canyon is today. The lake itself, as it dissipated into the lakes around here and as well back into the ocean, the valley settled right in here, or the, the river settled into the bottom of this valley right here. It flowed through, and when it reached this point of the canyon, it really bottlenecks into this spot. In 1983, a man named Frederick Schwatka came through this area, and he named a lot of these parts, um, and he named Miles Canyon. Now, it's not a mile long, it's actually 0 0.8 miles long. It's named after his uh, financier, Brigadier General Nelson A. Miles, and that's the name of Miles Canyon. That's 1883, and we'll jump ahead to 1896 when they found a large deposit of gold around Dawson City, starting the Klondike Gold Rush. Now, uh, it took a while for people to come up to, D to Dawson, so about 1897 is when word came out, and about 1898, 1899, that's when the real rush started and took place. And now, this wide area, the canyon, and the rapids afterwards was the most dangerous area of the Yukon River. So that's why Canyon City was created, to find a way to circumvent the dangerous uh, parts of the river. So you'd stop at Canyon City, and you'd find a safe way, either with a pilot or on the tramway, to get to Whitehorse, and on your way to Dawson. Between 35 and 10,000 years ago, we were under about 2 kilometers of ice where we are now. But farther north, uh, these glaciers actually caused the, the ocean levels worldwide to go down, and up north, uh, between Russia and Alaska, it's called the Bering Strait, it, this huge subcontinent called Beringia opened up. And, uh, well, it looked a lot like this. There wasn't enough moisture in the air for the trees to grow, but there was enough sediment coming off the glaciers and just enough moisture for just large grasslands, just like this, to grow along. And when you have grasslands, you get large mammals. Now, it's kind of hard to say, but we like to put it as kind of our African savanna in the north. Behind me, you can see a very aggressive landscape. Uh, it's uh, geographically is referred to as a kettle and came or a kettle and knob topography. These dips and rises you see before us are result of a stagnant glacier melting and dropping all of its sediment right where it was. One of the two deciduous trees we're going to talk about today is the trembling aspen. The leaves of this tree are attacked by a moth larva called the aspen leaf miner. Uh, what, the, what the miner does is it eats the spongy mesophyll, the chlorophyll, or well, the scientific name, the green stuff, and stops energy production for the tree. Now, with any other tree, that would kill the tree and kill all its descendants. But the aspen is surprising in the sense that uh, it actually is able to produce photosynthesis through its bark. Behind me, you can see. A willow tree, one of the 45 species we have in the Yukon. Some of the willow have a medicinal purpose. If you were to peel back the bark and get the inner green, bright green bark, it actually contains ASA, or uh, the chemical that aspirin is made of. It's used as a painkiller, and first thing you should put it in teas for that same purpose. This is a white spruce. 
the only kind of spruce found in this area. You can identify this tree by its short needles. If you were to peel back the skin, you'll see a very white inner bark. This is a lodgepole pine. You can identify it by its long uh, pairs of needles here. If you were to pull one off, you can see they actually come in pairs like this. Another way to identify them is by uh, their unique male versus female cones. Uh, the male cones are at the bottom of the tree, while the female are at the top in order to reduce cross-pollination. Throughout the Yukon Territory, we have very little topsoil because we are a semi-arid climate. And actually, we're very close to being a desert, and some areas are prone to desertification. So YCS, as a society, likes to stand behind the leave-no-trace outdoor philosophy which means that when you hiking through the mountains, you stay on beaten trails, and also when you make a campsite, you make as little trace as possible. And as they say, you take only memories and leave only footprints. Now around this area, along the highways and close to the Alaskan border, you may have noticed a white layer of sediment it's along the highways, and it looks a lot like this. Now, uh, it doesn't look very interesting along the highways, but the story behind it is quite amazing. Now this is called White River Ash, and it actually came from two eruptions of Mount Churchill or Mount Bono, just along the Alaskan-Yukon border. Now these two eruptions, well to put them into perspective, um, they're about ten times as large as Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980. So it's quite a, quite a massive eruption, actually one of the largest eruptions worldwide in the last 10,000 years. Now this in the air would have been a lot like breathing in little shards of glass. So it had been quite lethal to the First Nations people and the animals of this area. And it actually caused a migration of First Nations people close to the coast, or that's a theory at least. And there's also another theory that uh, it caused a migration of First Nations people all the way down to the southern states of America, around Arizona, where there is still a large population of Athabascan-speaking First Nations people. Now, around this area, it would have caused the year of two winters, because you imagine this in the sky falling down looking a lot like snow. So you had the actual winter, and you almost had somewhat of a, a nuclear winter. With this in the air, it would have blocked the sun, making it very, very cold on the ground. And with this in the air and on the soil, it would have made the whole area uninhabitable for at least, well, some say between 40 and 60 years. At least 20. So it's, it's quite impressive. The year of two winters in White River Ash. You can still see it to this day. Actually, in some areas, there's actually seven feet of compacted ash along the highway. Seven feet of compacted ash. Imagine that in the sky. Truly amazing. This is the Yukon's territorial plant, a fireweed. It's a very neat plant, has beautiful colors as well as neat uses for it, uh, itself. And in the younger plants, you can use the top leaves as a replacement for spinach, and the gorgeous pink leaves you see now, you can use for teas and jellies. This is the, the soapberry or bearberry bush. It's a very unique plant in the sense that it has edible as well as medicinal properties. The berries can be used uh, as a dessert. If you whip them up, you can make a meringue-like texture, and the First Nations used to use it uh, as a treat back in the day. This is Kinnikinnik. Kinnikinnik is a very important plant in the Yukon Boreal Forest as it anchors the soil and retains moisture for other plants. This is the wild rose plant of the Yukon. The berry here is called the rose hip, which is very high in vitamin C and it's a delectable treat in the Yukon. It's used for teas as well as jams. Welcome to Canyon City. Now, it may not seem like much, but just put yourself back in that position. About 30 to 50,000 people came through Canyon City, and it was, a, well, it was a very transient population. Now, there was about 40 to 50 permanent residents, but other than that, it was all a tent city way back into the hills. Everything that the pioneers ate when they came up here in 1899 was out of tin cans. Everything. There's no signs of hunting, and since it was such a transient place, they had no time to hunt. You'll see a series of these uh, middens and piles throughout the bush here where the tent city was. They're actually kind of a fascinating story. We have all sorts of food that came up. We have condensed milk in cans like this, as well as fruits and vegetables in the other round cans, and then uh, meat in the square and rectangular ones. The neatest thing about these cans is that they weren't very safe. First of all, your food is in constant contact with tin itself, which we are in today 
because we have a lining around our cans. Uh, but that wasn't the worst of it. All of their food was in constant contact with lead. All of their cans were sealed with lead. Welcome to Canyon City. My name is Norman McCauley. Gather around. Come ahead. Come ahead. Come right up here. Uh, you can see a fantastic example of uh, the tramway that I built with my own two hands right in front of you here. And I would like to offer you a service. See, I came up from Victoria. And uh, I had gold fever as well, as I see you guys do. And I have uh, toiled through the lakes and the river, and I made, made it to uh, Miles Canyon, and I, I almost died. But I knew that my people needed something to get past this treacherous canyon, so I bring you the Macaulay Tram Line. It is finally built with eight, by 18 men in 21 days. We went all the way from here to Whitehorse, which is far, far away. You can see I used the best round logs I could find and packed every wheel over the Chilkoot Pass. Now, I only want to bring you the best, so I have the best horses. I have 27 horses I take care of. I've also packed their hay in over the Chilkoot, because I want to bring you the best product I can. Now, if you're staying for a couple days, I have a whole wonderful hotel and saloon here, too. Make sure you go and gamble a little bit, drink a little bit, enjoy your time. But none of that. I'm sure many of you want to just get on and head up to Whitehorse. So, to use my tramway is a mere three cents per pound. Ah, it's too much. Or twenty-five dollars. Too per much. Oh, half burn. It's too much, Macaulay. I told you before, and I'll tell you again. It's too much, folks. He's trying to swindle you. On the other side of the river, I've built a much more, uh, let's say a much better tram line. Look at these Nonsense. round logs. The wheels are rounded logs. I made mine square to better serve Nonsense. the people. Nonsense. And three cents a pound when mine's a cent a pound with no charge rate for a boat. So, folks, who you want to deal with, this ragamuffin or myself? Obviously, the choice is clear. You don't even know this man. Uh, I am an honest, hard-working man. He uses <laughs> Chinese workers to do all of his work. He's a minor, his minor, folks. has uh, a pony. That's Who has a pony in the Yukon? His name is Clip Cop, and he's a fine little <laughs> no, pony, but he's just... He, he, <laughs> Waste some money. Uh, Nonsense. Know what happened? I'm tired of this. Coming down here and ruining my business? I'll give you... $50,000 if you leave me alone right now. If you get out of here and let me use your tramway. 70000 Oh, that's just too much. Make it sixty. Sixty thousand $60,000 and the promise I don't have to see your ugly face again. It's a deal. Well done. Little does he know that I was bought out three months later for $185,000. <laughs> now, a lot of people have wrote books and have ideas with the Klondike Gold Rush, but I, th I think it was put best by Pierre Burton when he said, there are gold rushes with more people, there have been gold rushes with more gold. There has never been a gold rush like the Klondike, and there never will be again. And that concludes our virtual tour for today. You've been an integral part of our Canyon City adventure. Thank you. That's exciting thought.